Hi, everybody. My name is Cassandra Tomason. I'm with uh, the Global Social Benefit Incubator. We're based out of Santa Clara University. And we work with social entrepreneurs who are impacting the base of pyramid communities. So the 4 billion people in the world who live on less than $4 a day. We get to work with them and provide business planning tools to those enterprises so that they can help reach more people. Um, we work with the entrepreneurs that are dealing with energy poverty, finding solutions to that, uh, finding solutions to food security, job security, um, health, access to health and access to clean water, things like that. And, and we do that um, through a 10 month long uh, combination of experiential and online learning that begins with several hundred applicants. And we mentor each of those applicants through three exercises um, with MBAs from the business school. And then we uh, narrow that several hundred people down to 20 scholarship winners. And we pair each of those scholarship winners up with uh, venture capital, um, serial entrepreneur, and executive level mentors. Each of those get two to three uh, mentors that are working with their organization um, over several months of online work focused on their business model, their business plan, and their investor pitch. And then they come to Santa Clara University for a two-week boot camp where we bring them uh, to classroom lectures from Silicon Valley experts like Jeffrey Moore, um, as well as Santa Clara University engineering and business school faculty. Um, so we've had 160 alumni over the past 10 years of the Global Social Benefit Incubator who have collectively impacted 75 million people all over the world. Um, 93% of those organizations are still operating and 55% are scaling. And some of our alumni that you may have heard of, uh, Kiva.org, um, a micro-lending online platform that's enabled over three, $30 million in loans to be made worldwide as one of our alumni, uh, as well as Husk Power Systems, who's uh, operating in the poorest state of India, and they're working on um, gasifying rice husks and generating electricity for uh, villages who are off the grid. And so they're taking a waste product that would normally rot in the field. They're providing an income to the rice farmers and they're gasifying it and creating electricity in these microgrids that are replacing kerosene and, and they're doing it at a rate cheaper than kerosene. Um, and you'll hear from Solar Sister coming up next, who's also one of our alumni from last year, doing great work. Um, so that's what we've been doing over the past 10 years. Uh, the next 10 years are going to look a little different for us. We're working on our goal of benefiting 1 billion people by the year 2020. And one of the ways that we're going to do that is having a on all online platform that we're currently piloting with the World Bank Development Marketplace and taking all the curriculum and mentoring and making it in completely online so that eventually we'll be able to train more social entrepreneurs who don't always have uh, the opportunity to come to Santa Clara. We talked about visas earlier. Sometimes they can't get visas to come. Sometimes they just can't take two weeks out of their, uh, their work schedule to come. So that's one way we're going to help more social entrepreneurs. Um, and we're also partnering with uh, Jesuit universities. So Santa Clara University is a Jesuit. And uh, being a part of this larger Jesuit network, we're working with um, organizations or with universities in Spain, in Colombia, in the Philippines. Uh, to replicate GSBI-like pro programs all over the world to reach our goal of benefiting 1 billion by 2020. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Neha Misra. Uh, I serve as the Chief Collaboration Officer uh, for Solar Sister. Uh, before I get into Solar Sister, uh, I would really like to lift the energy here a little bit. So uh, will you please do me a favor? When I say solar, will you say sister? Solar? 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 Okay, we're good now. I feel good. Um, so um, I serve as the Chief Collaboration Officer of Solar Sister. Uh, Solar Sister is an innovative social enterprise marrying woman power with green power to address energy poverty in Africa. I should add a disclaimer at the onset that I'm a relapsed economist, and I'm a poet and a visual artist in a parallel universe. And the reason I mention that is because I think, uh, especially the latter two, I think they feed in uh, to the larger discussion here, as well as to uh, the heart of what Solar Sister is as an organization. We are an innovation-driven driven organization. But even before innovation, which is action, comes creativity, which is the vision of uh, 
what you want to do from some crazy idea in your head. Um, when I met Al uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, um, uh, I knew that I'm going to be here the moment he said serendipity, because serendipity is uh, my favorite word, and uh, I take it that it is also his, because he uses it a lot. And I don't know if it's my favorite word, because uh, things keep happening to me randomly, uh, wonderful things, or do random things keep happening to me, uh, because it is my favorite word. Uh, so. Um, uh, you know, Muriel Rukhi, sir, she was a poet uh, and a an, uh, political activist. She wrote uh, a poetry anthology um, in 1968 called The Speed of Darkness. And in that she wrote that um, the universe is not made of atoms, it is made of stories. So what I really want to do uh, in my comments is put a human face to technology, um, because we are dealing with poverty, with, we are dealing with development, we are pe dealing with a lot of... Uh, statistics uh, driven um, some very harsh issues, but, uh, but numbers are not just numbers. Numbers have faces uh, behind them. So what I want to do very quickly is tell you three stories of Solar Sister, uh, which are uh, stories of light, hope, and opportunity. The story of light is also a story of darkness uh, in that there are 1.6 billion people in the world who do not have a single light bulb. Uh, just for a sense of perspective, that is a quarter of humanity. And it has been more than 132 years since Thomas Edison got the patent for his modern light bulb. And when he got it, what he said was that, my dream is that one day electricity will be so cheap that only the rich will be able to afford the candles. Now, wherever Thomas Edison is, God bless him, uh, I'm, I, I, I would think that he might be twisting in his grave because nor has electricity become very cheap, nor is it the case that only uh, that the poor uh, are not using candles. They are using candles, they're using dangerous candles. The second part of this story of darkness is that it, it has a huge gender uh, dimension. So if energy poverty was a person, it would be a woman, because 70% of those without uh, electricity are women and girls who are disproportionately affected because they are the ones who have household energy responsibilities. They are the ones who are working uh, in the kitchen uh, by the smoke. Uh, they are the ones, uh, as girls finish their household chores, and at, after sunset, when they have limited time to study, they can only study by a kerosene uh, light if they're lucky to have it, which is extremely dangerous. So the story of light is where the st story of Solar Sister started with, uh, with a woman called Rebecca uh, in a village in Fiji in Uganda. Uh, Re Rebecca uh, got a solar light, and uh, she uh, and her husband were discussing where to put this solar light. Husband said, well, obviously, this light is going to go in the entertainment room. Uh, but Rebecca is a pretty strong uh, woman. She stood her ground. She said, no, this light is going in the chicken room because she knew that her chickens would eat better when they have more light. So uh, there was more light, her chickens did eat better, they gave better eggs, she got more money, she got a goat, she got a pig, and today she runs a school where she teaches children and she teaches uh, small plot farming. So what this taught us was really uh, you know, the starting point of Solar Sister, that we look for big uh, silver bullet solutions, but a uh, lot of times small is beautiful starting with a single light that to us here uh, in our electrified worlds might not mean much, but a little can go a long way uh, you know, when you, you talk about development. The second story that I want to tell you is the story of hope, which is where Solar Sister comes in. What we do is essentially we address the cultural and, um, and, the, gen um, and the geographic uh, aspect of energy poverty, cultural aspect of energy poverty being that women are not being integrated in a green economy. And that is, uh, I can say, um, uh, having worked in energy sector since I started working, it's also the case here, it's also the case in India, and it's magnified as an as a issue when you're talking about a green economy in a rural setting. So what we do is essentially we take the business model that Avon, the cosmetic company, uses to sell lipsticks. What Avon does is Avon ladies sell beauty products through woman-to-woman -woman network. We take that model, apply that to development. Uh, solar sister entrepreneurs uh, are sort of like Avon ladies of uh, solar power. Uh, we uh, give them business skills, um, how to uh, do bookkeeping, how to do uh, sales pitches, uh, how to uh, transfer money using their mobile phone. 
and, um, and they go and sell products to their communities, not as charity. Uh, none of our products are subsidized. They sell these products that start from about $15. We have portable solar lights, uh, mobile phone chargers, radio chargers, and people are buying them. So um, the second thing that Solar Sister is doing is we, uh, we see ourselves as a mobile best buy of clean energy. We are not manufacturers. We are the last mile distributors. And why we are the last mile distributor is because a lot of times uh, products are so sexy. Uh, you know, you can get an award for a product because you can see it. But a last mile distribution kind of, it, it, it lingers on as something which is not addressed because companies are manufacturing great products, but how do you take a product from China to Kampala, the capital of Uganda, to a woman who really needs it and for whom the product was designed, who is in a village in eastern Uganda, in Kumi, or who's in Gulu in northern Uganda? Um, so that's the story of uh, Hope. We have a soul sister entrepreneur, um, Florence, one of her customers, uh, she got a solar light. Earlier, she had to travel uh, to two villages next to hers to do her tailoring business because she did not have any light uh, in, her, um, in her house. Now she runs the business right from her house. She also runs a chapati business, and her children deliver the chapatis right in the morning. And what this light means is, uh, is that just because she has light, uh, she has been getting remarks from her community that uh, you should stand for election now because she has light, and, and wow, you must be really awesome because you have light in your house. Um, so that's the story of hope. And finally, the story of opportunity is uh, we started by training 10 women entrepreneurs in early 2010. We are a fairly startup organization. Today we have 171 solar sister entrepreneurs in Uganda, Rwanda, and South Sudan, benefiting about 31,000 people. Our goal is to magnify that uh, uh, many, many, many folds. Uh, we uh, want to have a network of 5,000 solar sister uh, entrepreneurs across Africa, bringing clean energy to millions and millions. Um, and um, I think uh, there is uh, much to do. Um, challenges that I will just touch upon and we can get into them when we are in the detailed discussion. There are challenges of legal structure somebody spoke about. Right now we are, uh, we are structured as a 501c3 organization. We are a not-for-profit because we are dealing with market failures. We we could not just go ahead and structure ourselves as a for profit because we do need that foundation support to put the machinery in place. Um, the second challenge as we grow is that we are a social enterprise, a mission-driven organization. Uh, I have been part of the founding uh, team and I might be totally on fire with the mission. Uh, my colleague who is a founder, she might be totally on fire. Uh, but as you're expanding from 10 to 170 to 1,000 solar sister entrepreneurs and as you're hiring and recruiting, um, how, how do you make sure that people share that vision of what future you're trying to create, that your motivations are not just uh, extrinsic but also intrinsic? And, uh, and, and related to that is also that when we talk about patient capital, how patient is the, uh, is the patient capital with building the organizational capacity, really? And, um, and then another thing that comes full circle uh, is that as we are growing, there is innovation, but there's also creativity. How do you imbibe that culture of creativity as you're building a multinational social enterprise? Um, you know? and, um, and, and I'll end on one note which relates to a question which was asked today on one of the earlier uh, panels that how do you address these challenges? You know, how do you convince people to address these challenges? And I think that the answer lies in in the messaging and communication being aspirational. Um, uh, when I travel uh, in every nook and corner of Uganda, there is Coca-Cola there. And why is Coca-Cola there? Because Coca-Cola, when they are trying to sell a Coke bottle, they are not saying, uh, fight heat. No, that's not their communication strategy. Their communication strategy is open happiness. And which is the communication strategy that development sector has to learn from the private sector and from the Silicon Valley. Uh, you, it's, it's about dreams, it's about aspirations. So Solar Sister is not about darkness, despair, and lack of opportunity. That's, not, that's what it is right now, the people who are suffering from lack of light. But what we are trying to create is light, hope, and opportunity. So uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I sort of arrived a little late. I didn't realize it was 4 o'clock. Um, <laughs> so even as moderator, I, uh, I missed. Um, 
let me just say w uh, one word before I uh, introduce Professor Funamizu, which is, I mean, we've heard uh, in the previous panel about scaling up social enterprises and scaling up impact investing and, and how do you s use the impact investing, how do you use the franchise model, what can foundations contribute to the process. Uh, and w in, on this panel we've heard about global social benefit incubators. How can you take the incubation process that in a certain way you could say was developed and perfected here in Silicon Valley, but use it for a broader purpose above and beyond uh, what Silicon Valley incubators typically do and use it to help aspiring entrepreneurs in the social enterprise field. And we then just heard uh, of one, but uh, without meaning to diminish at all the, uh, the, the wonderful work that Solar Sister does, we heard about one social enterprise, but by no means is this the only social enterprise. There are many of them in a lot of different sectors. But you can begin to see how you can take an innovation, the LED light bulb, solar, that was developed for one purpose and suddenly start using it to develop, to distribute the last mile of electricity, to develop business models, to, to, to solve financial problems, and create jobs and employment for people. What we're going to hear next um, is, is something very special. And you'll hear a little bit more about it uh, tomorrow as well. But I just wanted to, a word of introduction. Japan, uh, in the, the J uh, JST, the Japanese Science Foundation, has been developing a wonderful program where they collaborate Japanese scientists doing world-class research with scientists in emerging markets all around world-class research, but it's world-class research focused on problems that are relevant to the local community. And what we're going to hear this uh, in a moment, as soon as I stop speaking, is one example uh, of a collaboration between Japan and Burkina Faso. Um, and, I, and I won't say more than that, um, but this is one of many collaborations that Japan is fostering between Japan and emerging market scientists. And then the question that the, the uh, Japan JST uh, colleagues put to me is, how do we then take the results of this research, which after all don't generate any benefits by itself, unless it gets moved from the research to the social enterprise? So that's really uh, what uh, we're going to be talking about. But uh, our next speaker, Professor Funamizu, is going to be talking about the work that uh, he has been doing in uh, Africa. Right. Thanks. I, I have a microphone. Thank you very much. Very kind introduction. I, I, I very much appreciate it. Yeah. Today I'd like to talk about the uh, sanitation project in Burkina Faso. And uh, I'm a person from the engineering field. But today I would try to talk about the business model. That's why today's uh, engineering person are challenging you, uh, the business persons. OK, so I very much appreciate the, uh, your critical comments. OK, so the, and also please allow me to use the PowerPoint file. This the engineering person that usually use the uh, yeah, PowerPoint presentation and they show the figures and some things. Please allow me to do, right? OK, so the, shall we start? The, uh, my talk is uh, my message today is a new business model is required is start from user's point of view, second, analyze their value chain, and include sanitation system in it, right? And they make a cross link between the sanitation system and then the agriculture. That's why we are saying agro-sanitation. So they are, let me introduce very briefly the current situation in a Burkina Faso. GDP is there one point, around one US dollar per day per capita situations. And the sanitation coverage percentage, especially rural area, only 6%. And the uh, generally people defecate in the toilet or open areas. So in these situations, yes, improvement of sanitation system is, yes, very urgent task. So that how can we introduce, uh, improve improve the sanitary conditions, 
I think when we talk about the sanitation system, there are six very important points, components. Yes, of course, users and the policies, institutions, and the finance, and the information system for the governance, maintenance, and of also the human resources. And finally, technologies. I'm a technological person, but uh, we have recognized only technologies cannot work well. We do need to discuss the policies, the institutions, finances. That's why today I will talk, try to talk the business model. And also, the, if we consider the current the business model for the sanitation and their problems, right? They are public, we are thinking the sanitation issue is the public services. So they are usually initiated by the government or municipalities. But this situation is available when we have the high governance capacity of the government or economic background. And also, the current model targets the public health or protect the environment. But this is for the public. User cannot realize this target easily. And the third point, expected benefit of the current the business model is decrease the mortality rate or decrease the medical cost or environmental conservation. But this is not a direct benefit to users. Especially in a rural area in a Burkina Faso, in their traditional language, they don't have the words meaning toilet. This means they don't have any idea of the toilet. So we do need to tell them the, what is a toilet, what is the benefit when you install the toilet. So that we are now saying toilet is a kind of the machine to produce fertilizer, right? So in this way, so that if the basic conditions are not met, what we should do? Okay, so that our approach is start, analyze users' value chains, then include the sanitation units into the users' value chain. This means we try to motivate them to manage it by themselves. And the third point is that we'd like to design the linkage to the agricultural activities. This means create value from sanitation systems. And we'd like to analyze the market of the vegetables so that we'd like to maximize and stabilize the user's income. And we'd like to estimate income by the sanitation units. Then we can show the direct merit to the users. Our rough estimation, the one family can obtain 200 US dollar annually by installing toilet systems, right? Only 200 dollar US dollars, but I think this is very important. And also, then we'd like right to make a financial plan. This is a kind of the business model, and they are, and finally, we'd like right to design the hardware. So the, uh, under the, this approach, we examined the, their value chains. Uh, there are lots of things in their figure, but uh, we found that money flow, cash flow is only from the vegetable gardens operated by housewives. So if we could support the vegetable gardens operated by the housewives, Yes, it's very good incentives for them. So that's why we are thinking that to show the clear benefit to the users, the, uh, we are thinking recognize the uh, gray water and the black water as a personal property, right? Not waste. And their treatment is a kind of their action to improve their value. And we'd like to use this for the agriculture. So that that's why we recognize the sanitation system as an agro-sanitation asset. So the, we would like to ask the people to invest some amount of money based on the income from the toilet system. That's our ideas. And also final point is the target customer is housewives because housewives 
owned her own vegetable gardens in order to obtain her income. So it's reasonable to design the system that the wife's own and ma manage her own agri-sanitation asset. So the, this figure is our business model. The key point is one is rural household has agro-sanitation asset and obtain the income from the vegetable production to the markets. And the second important group is a facilitating organization. This group has three functions. One is microfinance system, make a loan, right, to their agro-sanitation asset, and also technical support for the agricultural activity, not sanitation system, and marketing support. Okay, I think it is time coming. We have also developed the low cost composting type toilet and the gray water management, but I, I just showed the, the f uh, pictures we installed in the pilot families. That's also the, how they are using their gray water and the urine in the agricultural activities. Okay, thank you. I think we have already, right, there. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you very much. Um, it, it seems to me that, again, what, we've, what we see here is the opportunities to create jobs, to create income through innovation and entrepreneurship, um, not, again, just in high-tech sectors, but in very mundane areas, but using creative uh, engineering where you begin to see the, the link between agriculture, household waste, human waste, and it, 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 it becomes a way of, of moving society up. Um, where, so uh, perhaps I'll open it up to some questions, uh, comments from, from people. Do, do any of you have comments from what, e what each other has said? And I know, Nea, you were talking about the financial model a little bit. Uh, d did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, sure. I also have a question um, yeah. for you. So in this case, um, so there isn't a demand right now, as in you're trying to create a demand. So would you, I would see that as a challenge, right? Because uh, it's so different. Like what we are trying to do is uh, people need energy. Mm -hmm. And there's a very clear articulated dema mm -hmm. demand that they have. And we're also trying to inc include improved cook stoves in our business portfolio. Mm -hmm. And there it's a problem because people do not connect the dots, be dots between uh, health issues and um, having a cook stove, which is not right. efficient because it's been done for so many years. Do you find, as, in, as you are beginning to roll this out, uh, as in culturally, how do you deal with that issue that, mm. uh, you know, when you're trying to bring in a technology in a, you know, that... Yes. cultural setting but as to the demand of the peoples and on the sanitation system as i mentioned in my talk the they have nature mm -hmm. right for the sanitation issues so that they are using the nature mm -hmm. for the defecations that's why it's very hard for them to mm -hmm. understand right the requirement of the, those kind of sanitary facilities, mm -hmm. right? That's the starting point. That's why that we are saying, right? Toilet is a kind of the machine for producing fertilizer. Mm -hmm. But they, are, they have the demand, right? To produce uh, more vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. And also, and even in a dry season, right? They mm -hmm. would like to cultivate the vegetables because they can sell those at very high prices. Okay, so that the, this is the, their demand, right? Mm -hmm. So we would like to connect these, right? Mm -hmm. Agricultural activities and the toilet system is that this is the main reasons why. One comment that I'll make and then I'll uh, question. I thought it was very interesting what uh, you were saying because again, you started by a detailed uh, study, sociological study right. of what was going on in the village and what was going on in mm -hmm. people's lives, because it's not only a matter of just sort of finding a technology, mm -hmm. exporting it, mm -hmm. and dropping yeah. it, parachuting yeah, right. it in. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work. We know that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so 
It really requires a way of finding the technology that can be integrated intelligently mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. people's yeah. lives. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a session tomorrow morning talking about design issues. Mm -hmm. And one aspect of those design issues yes. is doing precisely what right. you were doing, yep. which is understanding how the product that you're right. uh, trying to produce or right. sell uh, fits into people's daily lives mm -hmm. and what value it produces for right. them. Yes, please. Actually, the, uh, our project has started the, uh, two and a half years ago. So the, w one of the, our colleagues and also sociologists uh, entered the community, and the, uh, but there are not so much groups, right? And so the, we observed a couple of their pilot families, and we, we saw that the, uh, what is their value. Right? And uh, we'd like to connect their value and our system. Right? That's a, maybe I think this is a very natural way to connect the sanitation system, the agriculture. Yeah. Well, I have a microphone. Yeah, okay, let me take over here and then I'll uh, yeah. yeah. I was, yeah, I was, uh, I was just wondering about the. the Did you program. identify yourself? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I belong to an NGO in Egypt called Masr al Khair. I'm Chief Knowledge Officer. I was just wondering about the program that targeted the people below $4 a day and the impact on 75 million people, how this was quantified, and where do you take people from below $4 to what? I mean, to, to the $4 limit? I mean, what's your objective if, if in, in, in this case? And the other question is about, like, again, the value chain. If there's a systematic methodology for value chain analysis for communities that you are implementing. So, what's your thought? Sure. Um, so, at the Global Social Benefit Incubator, we have our own target market. Um, uh, we're looking at social entrepreneurs who benefit the base of the pyramid. And that's what I meant by the four, four billion people living on less than $4 a day. So there's a lot of social en definitions of social enterprises, um, people working with disadvantaged groups, solving social problems all over the world. But the entrepreneurs that we work with, uh, where we feel that we can provide the most value with uh, the work that we do is the entrepreneurs who are in the field, largely in developing countries. Um, so that's, that's where that number came from. And the 75 uh, million people impacted, again, that comes from the social entrepreneurs that we work with. So we survey them all and, and try to understand exactly how many people Solar Sister has impacted you know, through their distribution network of, of Solar Sisters and how many lights um, are how many how much light are they bringing into the community? How many people are in those households that no longer have to breathe in kerosene fumes things like that? So whether or not we can say that we caused those numbers um, We certainly had an interaction with these organizations along the way um, And we we love to think that you know what we do has had a direct impact, but it's a broader number uh, It's not a direct Well, I think there is a direct impact. I mean, so when you, when you take out a kerosene lantern out of a household and you replace it with a rechar solar rechargeable light, um, you're foregoing a lot of respiratory health problems and household fires, things like that. And when I gave the example of Husk Power Systems earlier, um, he's, they're going into villages that are completely off the grid in uh, the poorest state in India, and they have, they're using kerosene. And, you know, as I mentioned, respiratory health problems, it's expensive. Um, and they're going in and they're providing additional income to the farmers for a waste product. They're reducing carbon emissions and they're providing light where there was none. So um, th the number of lives impacted by that is, is kind of what goes into that number.
And uh, if I can just add, you know, I think it's also a question of when you're talking about monitoring and evaluation, and I say this with my economist hat, that what is not measured is not valued, uh, although my artist hat will say that stories are important and anecdotal uh, uh, evidence is also important. So uh, it's also a question of at the onset when you're talking about impact investing or in an ecosystem to, to lay out those terms exactly. What does it mean, energy poverty, uh, you know, if you're going to address uh, in terms of sales of the products, in terms of increase of income of the people that we are selling those products to, in terms of reducing the number of fire burn injuries. So, uh, I, and I, I, I think that's something that GSBI works with. And, and again, it's a very case by case uh, uh, thing that depending on the nature of the enterprise, it would uh, vary. Uh, Oh, I think the uh, analyzing the uh, value chain is a very traditional, right, <laughs> way. So the, I think the, just the way we applied this the, uh, measure uh, protocols to the families in a rural area. But I did not mention in my talk, but the, uh, we do need also analyze value chains of the investor, right? Or value chain of the local or national government or value chain of the local factories, right, to provide, provide their uh, toilet systems. So that we do need to uh, analyze uh, many, many value chains. That's the kind of the uh, value chain of the ecosystems, right. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Thanks to Prof. Uh, Funamizu. Yes. I would like to make a comment on his presentation, and I think uh, to highlight one dimension, which is uh, the cooperation. Because I think when we speak about uh, innovation, we speak a lot about uh, connection, about exchange, about, uh, I think, uh, uh, partnership. And this is a very good example of a project where you have a technology developed in Japan and uh, implement in another uh, area in Burkina Faso. And this project was the opportunity to put uh, institutions together, I think, uh, Hokkaido University working with the technology in Japan and Chuaiye working in the local uh, condition because there is a need to adapt uh, the technology to uh, the local context the local sociology, because there is a need to uh, appropriate uh, the technology. Mm -hmm. And this means that there is a need of local expertise. And, and I think uh, people uh, in place should be trained for this. And at UAE, we, br we bring this expertise to uh, Hokkaido. And together, I think uh, we, we, we build uh, a very nice uh, project for uh, uh, community. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the, may I add the one small? They are asked to the technologies, right? They are, we are not thinking just to transfer the, our technology to adapt the local the Burkina Faso situations. Right? We'd like to share the common goals. I mean, right, we'd like to develop the low carbon society or uh, recycling society. I think the people in the right, Burkina Faso, they are very happy because they don't have now the infrastructures, but they can e uh, easily to reach the, those kind of societies because they, we, we, in Japan, we have already invested lots of money for their infrastructures, right? It's very hard to change the mm -hmm. systems, but there are people in the developing countries, unfortunately, they don't have the any inf infrastructures, but they can easily, right, directly reach to the very good society. Let's see another comment on the technology. Thank you. Over here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I've been forgetting you. Um, nothing personal. Uh, so first of all, thank you so much for your fascinating presentations and for your great work. Um, and I want to address this to the room as much as to the panelists, because there's been an elephant in the room since I've been here, um, which is that we're talking about disruption of systems and about inclusion and diversity. And this is an incredibly diverse room, except for in one dimension, which is gender. 
And if you look around the room, there are more women here right now, probably because there are women on the stage, but if you look at the overall composition of who's on the stage and who's in this room, it's predominantly male. And yet, we're talking about solving the world's problems, and the reference keeps coming up to who are the decision makers and who are the end users of some of these technologies. And a lot of the input that we need, both at this level here and at the level of the developing countries, is from the women. So my question is, um, oh, and, and as I've brought this topic up, I don't think that this is um, an, ex an explicit or intentional exclusion. Um, I think it's something that happens by virtue of the system that we operate in. And I brought it up and I've gotten wonderful examples of, well, you need to go talk to this other woman, woman that's helping other women. And I think it's a much broader, broader issue than that, in that if we're gonna solve these problems, we all need to be thinking about how to include women's voices in the conversation. So I wanna throw that back to the panel and hear your comments on how do we do that effectively? Um, if I can say, you know, from Solar Sister perspective, I think firstly it's really important to, um, to communicate that uh, why we need to include women uh, is uh, not out of charity, it's not out of compassion, and um, it, uh, those are all very valid and good reasons. But uh, for example, uh, off-grid energy market is a $1 trillion market. And women, they uh, have purchasing power. They play important role in household um, consumer decisions. Uh, they're also the ones who have household energy-related responsibilities, uh, like I said, whether it's collecting the fuel wood or, or kerosene. So if we are really to make a disruptive change, you know, how can we forget about the majority and make that change. And I say that both from the demand side of it, how can we not educate women about what transformation a solar light bulb can bring from w versus using a dangerous kerosene light, and also from supply chain, that for all the talk about green economy, uh, so much of it is so top down, and we are talking about bottom up innovation, so what does a, a Rio Plus 20 summit mean to a woman in a village in Africa who has not seen electricity in her whole life and whose uh, children uh, grew up knowing that grid is coming, grid is coming, but grid has not come. Now children have 10 children of their own and grid is still not there. And here we have, uh, we, we are planning of flights. Uh, um, we are, we are, I believe we are planning to have a human settlement on Mars. And, and yet there are people who have not seen a single light bulb. Uh, and I think it's, um, it's, it's, it's on, on one side, uh, think about a global shame, you know. And, and, but, but shame is another thing. But why we should do this is not because of the shame, because of the tremendous opportunity that we have. And I think that has to be our message uh, on what we aspire to be and not what we don't, do not want. Yeah. yeah, to the, our sanitation issues, there are uh, positive side and a negative side. The, I said that our target customer is uh, housewives because they, are, they have their own vegetable gardens as a kind of the income source. That's why we'd like to support them. And they also, though, we observe that in their families, right? Husband has their own wallet, right? Wife has another wallet. So the uh, housewives has to take care of their children and the education, everything. So that if we could support them, right? We be able to the support all the families and uh, we'd like to improve their uh, kind of the lifestyles and the quality of the life. But negative side is when we install the toilet system, who will clean up the toilet, right? Who will right, take care of the management of the compost or urine? So the, we are now, we would like to start the observation. After installing the sanitary systems, what will happen? Change? Uh, are there any change in the lifestyle of the especially the housewives? Right? The, maybe, a, uh, maybe a next chance, right? We'll be able to report what will happen. Right? Uh, uh, we are very interested in this. 
Uh, just to add one more thing. So um, at the, the program, at the Global Social Benefit Incubator, we, we focus a lot on bringing the Silicon Valley DNA and expertise to the people working in the developing world. But uh, what we're also trying to do is bring a lot of the lessons uh, that we're learning from the social entrepreneurs to the developed world because um, they're the ones that are empowering women entrepreneurs to sell lights uh, to other women who are controlling those purchases for homes. Um, we have two entrepreneurs coming this year who are manufacturing banana stem leaves to make sanitary pads because women and children miss school and work every month if they don't have the money to buy those important products. And so I think the social entrepreneurs are the answer to a lot of these questions because um, they understand that out in the field and in the rest of the world, um, when you empower women, you empower communities. And um, I think that's some very important for us all to embrace. Mm -hmm. Just one Common, Cassandra, would you, would you like to just mention that you're having this whole Global Social Benefit Incubator month coming up in uh, Santa Clara? Oh, thank you. And I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so right now, everybody's been working online with their mentors that I mentioned earlier. They are coming to Santa Clara University um, from all over the world. They're going to show up on August 11th. And on August 23rd, we are having our business plan presentation. So the entrepreneurs have been preparing for this for eight months. And so I'd like to extend an invitation to you all to come to Santa Clara University on Thursday, August 23rd. It's an all-day event. It's free. Um, you can register online at our website, and you can come hear the pitches from these extraordinary men and women who are, who are creating very, very positive change in the world. Yeah, and I should, just as another shameless plug for Santa Clara University, <laughs> in addition to being extraordinarily interesting, it, it's, it's a wonderfully beautiful and historic Gorgeous. campus. So. Gorgeous. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's great Bring sightseeing as well as great yeah. education. Okay, Nia, we're we're going to have to wrap up, but uh, Nia, Yeah, I just want to, want to quickly add a, a, a line because you asked me to uh, touch yes. on financing. And um, I want to add that, you know, we started Solar Sister as a not-for-profit social enterprise. And when you will see within this room, there's the whole spectrum of uh, people who would only fund a for-profit, people who would only fund a not-for-profit when you're talking about social change. And I just want to say that there is the only rule is that there is no rule. And uh, if we are to solve some of these biggest challenges that we have, we need to go with a combination at what stage of growth you are in. For what has worked for us is bootstrapping. We have got some foundation money. USAID has given us money recently through the Development Innovation Ventures. We have um, got backing by Draper Richards Cape Land Foundation, which invests in um, social entrepreneurs. And I just want to leave on that thought that uh, there is no one silver bullet. And, and again, uh, reiterating, the only rule is that there is no rule and that we should move ahead with that and do what it takes. Well, thank you all very much um, for your presentations, for your time and consideration. And again, I just want to stress that from my perspective, this is another important dimension when we talk about innovation and entrepreneurship. Again, to get away from the fiction that innovation and entrepreneurship is only about high tech. It's only about iPhone apps. It's that. But it's also equally about this. And if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, uh, and you look at the emerging markets, and you look at the unserved population, you come away with the conclusion, especially when you then look at all the economic problems in the OECD world, that in the next 30, 40 years, this is where there's going to be tremendous opportunities. And if you can marry the, the Silicon Valley uh, um, policies, programs, and insights to solving some of these problems, you will really have a very powerful model and that's going to be the, the engine that drives the world. And if Silicon Valley is not the one doing it, well, that's fine. There's going to be a lot of people bubbling up from the bottom in the emerging markets, and they'll be the ones who will do it, and that's probably the way it ought to be. So thank you very much. Thank you.